Hello and warm greetings to all. Welcome to today's webinar that will be exploring the text of Advent, finding good news and anti and avoiding anti-Semitism with speaker and speaker Amy Jill Levine. Welcome to everyone who has gathered here, and we will hear from Amy Jill shortly. Today's webinar is a bilingual one that features English and French interpretation. To find your preferred language, please hover over the icon that looks like a globe, select that, and then please choose your preferred language. Bonjour encore. Je m'appelle Adèle Halliday. Et je suis la responsable Welcome again. de l'équité et de la lutte contre le racisme avec l'Église unie du Canada. Canada. Je suis très so heureuse que vous soyez tous en ligne aujourd'hui. That you are all online here today. Here's a bit of introduction and context for this evening's gathering. Um, as part of my anti-racism staff role with the United Church, I offer leadership and coordination for the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. And this webinar is one part of the 40 days. And this overall program around the 40 days is designed to offer people across the church a focused time of faithful learning, reflection, and anti-racist action. You're welcome to find the full English language program by going to the United Church website united-church.ca and searching for the 40 days. This year, there are several different parts to the English language program. Each week, there are two written reflections which feature content, they offer a faith reflection and suggested ideas for action. This week's reflection are uh, combating anti-Semitism in Advent written by Hayran Kim Craig, and Uprooting Christian Anti-Judaism, written by Michelle Foss. And these are both available online, uh, and you're welcome to explore those if you would like. There are also some featured books, and this week's books are authored all by Amy Jo Levine. One book is called The Difficult Words of Jesus, A Beginner's Guide to His Most Perplexing Teachings. And another book is Entering the Passion of Jesus, A Beginner's Guide to Holy Week. Both of these books are available from the United Church Bookstore, which is united, uh, sorry, ucrdstore.ca. And there's a discount code that is valid for 15% off orders of two or more books, and that code is 40 days. Uh, Amy Jill has also written a very extensive collection of books, and there are some additional books that may be of interest. One is her Advent focus book, which is called Light of the World, A Beginner's Guide to Advent, as well as Jesus for Everyone, Not Just Christians. Um, both of these books, you may opt to get uh, copies of these books at your local or independent bookstore. In terms of the 40 days, there's also an English language anti-racism newsletter if you might want to stay up to date with what else is happening. And as well, the anti-racism Facebook group is an excellent way to share ideas and insights. Now, for today's webinar, our gathering time online today will be about one and a half hours. For those, among, for those who are live online at the moment, the Zoom chat is closed for participants to be messaging across. But feedback, yeah, mostly because feedback from participants in previous webinars have noted a preference for the chat option staying off. If, however, you have questions, you are very welcome to send them by email to anti-racism at united-church.ca. So questions are welcome there anytime. This webinar will include an English language PowerPoint, and if you would like to receive a French language version of the PowerPoint, please also do email us again at anti-racism at united-church.ca. Finally, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Amy Jo Levine, who will speak to us about the text of Advent, finding good news and avoiding anti-Semitism. We are thrilled that she is here to speak with us today. She is a highly regarded speaker, author, and scholar. Amy Jo Levine, known to her friends as AJ, 
is a Rabbi Stanley M. F. M. Kessler Distinguished Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies at Hartford International University for Religion and Peace, and University Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies Emerita, and Mary Jane Worthen, Professor of Jewish Studies Emerita at Vanderbilt. She is the author and co-author of numerous books, a few of which have already been named. AJ is the first Jew to teach New Testament at Rome's Pontifical Biblical Institute, an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the first winner of Salzburg Prize for Jewish Christian Relations, and the 2023 recipient of the H. Walter Award for Reconciliation and Interfaith Cooperation from the Archbishop of Canterbury. AJ describes herself as an unorthodox member of an orthodox synagogue and a Yankee Jewish feminist who works to counter biblical interpretations that exclude and oppress. Please join me in offering a very warm welcome to Amy Jill Levine. Thank you very much. Um, and greetings to you all this evening from Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> Pray for us here in the United States. Um, what we're going to do this evening is we're going to talk about uh, how some of the, the good news about Christmas, the gospel about Christmas, goes goes sideways, goes wrong because of um, unintended anti-Semitism. So as I go through, if some of the concerns that I've raised, you've actually stepped in. It's not your fault. You did not know. Um, and my agenda is is not to blame anybody. Uh, it, it's rather to provide gentle correction. If, however, you continue to step into this mess after you've worked with me, you will go to hell. Um, if you have any particular concerns or questions about this presentation, um, I would welcome you to email me. I'm very easy to find on the internet, whether at Hartford International University or Vanderbilt University, and I have a Facebook page. I don't want anybody uh, fussing uh, in the internet about me. If you have a concern, talk to me about it. And if you're right and I'm wrong, then I'll fix it. And if I'm right and you're wrong, I'll fix that too. So we'll start simply by sharing screen and hope that the miracle of technology works. There we go. I'm hoping that's up there. Good. Okay. Um, let me move this. Whoops. Um, Here's our process, just to get a sense of how we're going to do this. Um, and there are various ways of doing it. We'll talk about the general mistakes that find their way into Christian preaching and teaching. We'll talk about the importance of words, um, and this will relate to words that that now are so overdetermined, so problematic, that how do we use words like Israel, given what's, go given what's going on in the Middle East? How do we use terms like Palestinian. We'll look at how Matthew chapters 1 and 2 and Luke chapters 1 and 2, those are the two Christmas stories, uh, fit into the broader Jewish tradition, um, as well as how to understand Christmas as, as taking place uh, among Jewish people, with Jewish people like Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Um, and then we'll have time for questions for you. Um, I know this is being translated, so I will go against my normal inclination and try to speak slowly. Um, if I speed up, somebody might want to give a shout out while I'm talking and say, AJ, slow down. All right, let's move on and see if this works. So mistake one is simply the anti-Jewish foil. And this is fairly common. Um, one way of trying to make Jesus look good is to make Judaism look bad. And the worst one can make Judaism look, the better Jesus looks, as if he's this shiny diamond amid this first century Jewish muck. Now, I'm Jewish. I do not worship Jesus as Lord and Savior, but my gosh, he was smart. And he had some fabulously profound things to say about ethics. I think the Christmas story is is heartwarming and heart-wrenching, and it's world literature, not just Christian literature. So I do not need to make first century Judaism look bad in order to make the Christmas story good news or, to, or in order to have Jesus appear profound. If I don't need to do it, Christians don't need to do it either. So here's just one example from Peter Vayner, I mean, who, who I think is a very, very smart man, a journalist. Um, typically, in the New York Times or the Washington Post um, or whatever newspaper happens to be your paper, on Christmas Eve or the day before, there, some journalist says something about Jesus. Uh, and very often these statements about Jesus wind up 
playing into that stereotype about how distinctive Jesus was in his own first century environment. And he is distinctive in certain ways. I mean, theologically, he is, for Christians, the only begotten son of God. He's the only one with that as a job description. But the distinction is usually marketed in terms of social concerns. So here's an article from 2020, not that long ago. First century Christians weren't prepared for what a truly radical and radically inclusive figure Jesus was. He shattered barrier after barrier. And then I got to figure out, like, what what barriers did he shatter? Um, did he welcome women? Yeah, but women were welcomed in first century Judaism. Uh, did he chat on occasion with Gentiles? Sure. But Gentiles worshipped in synagogues and came to pray in the Jerusalem temple. Did he, was he concerned about kids with children? Sure. But it's Jewish parents and caregivers who keep bringing their children to Jesus to touch or to bless. So in the simple rhetorical move about Jesus, the barrier shatterer, what happens is in the imagination of the reader, it's Judaism that's constructing all these barriers that Jesus has to break down. Again, we don't need to make Judaism look bad in order to make Jesus look good. And vague rhetoric is part of the problem. So Christmas, the holiday, should not be an occasion to proclaim freedom from the Torah, as if Jesus ended all those commandments. To the contrary, Torah is in fact liberating because it gives us guidelines on what would be healthy for us, like do not murder and do not steal and honor the Sabbath. Um, and it provides us a sense, in fact, of liberation. Um, Christmas does not proclaim the end of Judaism because Jesus and his followers are still Jews. And we can see that, for example, in the Gospel of Luke, where the first two chapters describe the circumcision of John, eventually called John the Baptist. John the Baptist's parents did not him, name him John the Baptist. That would have been awkward. Um, or the circumcision of Jesus or the dedication of Jesus in the temple and Mary's going through purity rituals. Christmas does not indicate a new concern for universalism because Jews and Gentiles had lots of contacts with each other, including the visit of the Magi. Um, Christmas does not proclaim the invention of feminism, where we have, for example, Mary's beautiful hymn called the Magnificat uh, in the Gospel of Luke. Because all people, according to Judaism, are in the divine image, and Mary's hymn in the Gospel of Luke very much echoes Hannah's song at the beginning of 1 Samuel. Nor does it give us a new concern for the disabled, because we have disabled people in the scriptures of Israel, like Isaac, who is blind, Jacob, who is blind, Mephibosheth, he's Jonathan's son. Remember David's friend, Jonathan, Jonathan's son. He can't walk because of a childhood accident. Um, so the idea of caring for the socially vulnerable or caring for the disabled is already part of the Jewish tradition. So when you proclaim the good news of Christmas, and Christmas has a lot of good news to proclaim, try not to use Judaism as the negative foil in order to proclaim it. Here's mistake number two, and this is the question of what's going to happen to Mary. So I'll give you the verse, and the next slide I'll give you what the problem is. This is a quote from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1, the birth of Jesus the Messiah. And the Greek actually says, Jesu Christu, Jesus the Christ. Christ is simply the Greek translation of the Hebrew term Messiah, took place this way. When his mother Mary had been, had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, so the papers have been signed, but they haven't moved in together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Uh, we would call this, in modern terms, an unwed mother. So then what happens because of this? So, this is an old church in Delaware. Um, it is now a rebuilt, very, very tall and fancy and wealthy church. And a number of years ago, I was invited to be the scholar in residence at this church. Um, it was during Advent. I was supposed to talk about John the Baptist. It was a church with three services. So you had the eight o'clock stalwarts, the 11 o'clock service with, with the band and the trumpets. And then at 12, you had the youth worship, the children's service in the gym. So I give my talk about John the Baptist for the first two services. Everything goes fabulously. I'm now in the gym at 12 o'clock. There's a praise band. I don't know if you have a church with praise bands. 
I kind of like organs and old fashioned hymnals, but, but I get the praise band thing. Um, they had a little service for children where children were given toothpicks and told that every time they did a good deed, they could use a toothpick to help construct the manger for baby Jesus. I thought that was very sweet, peculiar, but sweet. Then a woman comes out, 16 year old girl with a pillowcase on her head, um, wrapped in a bed sheet and clearly a pillow underneath. And she's now the pregnant Virgin Mary. She does a liturgical dance, which is difficult to do when you're wearing a pillow. Um, and then she announces, I'm pregnant. Her mother, wearing matching pillowcase and bedsheet, comes up and says, you're pregnant? You and Joseph are not married yet. You've just committed adultery. You have to be stoned. And then the praise band with the drum starts going, stone her, stone her, stone her. And all the little kids put down their toothpicks and they start clapping their hands going, stone her, stone her. And then Mary in bed sheet and pillowcase explains that with the birth of her child, we will no longer have the Old Testament God of wrath, but the New Testament God of love. And we will no longer be imprisoned under the law, but we will be free in Christ. And therefore, there will be no more horrific treatment of women. Everybody claps. Now I have to give the sermon. So instead of talking about John the Baptist, who I set aside, I explained that, no, they weren't stoning people for adultery back then, that Mary was not about to be stoned, um, that this is a quite unfortunate way of reading the text and quite unfortunate way of teaching little children. So how do I know that they're not about to be stoned? Well, because they're simply not. And even the story of the woman taken in adultery in the Gospel of John, the one where Jesus says, let the one without sin cast the first stone. If you read the Gospel of John chapter 8, nobody's carrying stones. They're not about to stone her. They're simply testing him. We may come back to that. So what happens? Uh, menschlich is a Yiddish term. It comes from the German mensch, which means man. Uh, a mensch in Yiddish is like a, a truly, absolutely decent person, like a full human being. Menschlich is the correct and proper thing to do. Joseph, being a righteous man, and Matthew loves the word righteous, by the way. Everybody in Matthew is righteous. Um, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace. I mean, he's going to divorce her, but he's not going to make a big deal about it. Just, I mean, you know, we'll just take care of the paperwork. If, if you sign the paperwork, you have to fill out more paperwork. He'll just divorce her. Um, this also avoids the idea of the stereotype of legalism. People can do what they want. We're women stoned for adultery, just to give you the details. And if you want to get the, the, the slides from this PowerPoint, you can have them. In the Gospel of Luke, we're told that Jesus' opponents are trying to test him. Um, if he says, don't stone her, don't do it, they're going to question his authority. They have the tradition of the elders. They have post-biblical teaching that tells them not to do any stoning. Um, if he says, don't stone her, then they can say, you're disregarding law. Um, if he says, okay, stone her, they can accuse him of violating Roman law because the Romans didn't allow Jews capital punishment privileges, at least according to John. Um, if he says stone her, they can accuse him of, of going against Torah because there's no person there with her. And it takes legally and practically at least two people to commit adultery. If he says stone her, they can accuse him of lack of compassion. So the, it's a trick. Whatever he says, he's going to get into trouble. But the point is, they're not about to stone her. Second mistake we frequently get is the idea of the greedy innkeeper. So in the Gospel of Luke, we hear about this census that went out from Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor, that all the world should be registered. This is like taking a census. Today, when you take a census, it's usually done for social services um, or for governmental representation. In antiquity, if you took a census, it was to find out how much money you could collect in taxes and whom you could conscript for the army. So generally, people did not like to have a census taken. There's no evidence from Roman history that the entire empire submitted to a census at one particular time. So the history of the census is a bit problematic. But for Luke, it's less the his historicity than how the story works. According to Luke, everybody went to their own hometowns. Uh, can just imagine the population movement, everybody going back to where they were born to be registered. 
And Joseph, who is of the family of David, goes to Bethlehem because Bethlehem is the city of David. He goes to be registered with Mary. They are engaged. This is not Matthew's story. This is Luke's. Um, they're engaged. They haven't yet gotten married. Mary is very pregnant. And when they finally land in Bethlehem, Mary gives birth to her firstborn child. She wraps him in bands of cloth. You may recall the old King James swaddling clothes and places him in a manger, which is a feeding trough because there's no room at the inn. And then we have countless numbers of children's books and Christmas pageants and whatnot, where the problem is the greedy innkeeper. Here's just one example. This Ebenezer Scrooge somehow made it back to the first Christmas. So the mistake, the greedy Jewish innkeeper rejects Joseph and Mary because they can't pay the room charge. And in the, um, the advertisement for this book that you can read, this delightful children's musical uh, talks about the greedy, obsessed Bethlehem innkeeper recommended for grades kindergarten through eight. This charming musical is filled with seasonal scripture and English carols and hymns. The first thing to note in the Gospel of Luke, and you've just seen the text, is there is no innkeeper. So why invent one? And why invent one who's greedy, given various stereotypes of Jews as lovers of money? Simply not helpful. Mistake number four concerns ritual purity. Well, I've heard a number of sermons and read a number of blogs that explained that Mary is shuffled off to the manger for fear that if she gives birth in the improper, then everybody around her would become ritually impure. So they're moving her. No. As Luke explains, there's no room at the inn, period. What does that mean? There's no room at the inn for Mary to have a baby. It takes some space. And generally, when people give birth, they do want a little bit of privacy. Right? You don't want people carrying like a beer walking around going, you know, how about them maple leaves? Um, so you want some privacy. Um, the manger, by the way, is part of Luke's concern for table fellowship, what's called common, commensality. Um, and Luke has, has peppered the infancy story with bread images. The word Bethlehem, bet means house, and lechem in Hebrew means bread. So Bethlehem literally means the house of bread. Um, Jesus will meet people at table. Jesus eats indiscriminately. He'll eat with anybody anywhere, and he'll even cater 5,000 in the Gospel of Luke, 5,000 plus 4,000 in Mark and, and, and Matthew both. Um, well, where else would you put the person who, according to the Gospel of John, is the bread of life, the bread for the world? You put him in a feeding trough. So the symbolism is actually carrying us through to this idea of table fellowship. And the reason Jesus keeps meeting people at table and Luke and Matthew and Mark and even John keep accentuating bread and food and table fellowship is because one dominant Jewish view of the Messianic age, you know, what happens when the kingdom of God appears, the world to come arrives? We eat. Heaven is a giant banquet, according to the prophet Isaiah. And Jesus is literally giving people a foretaste of that banquet by sharing table fellowship with them. Luke gets us going with this, with Bethlehem and the feeding trough. And in terms of the bands of cloths or swaddling clothes, um, in the book, The Wisdom of Solomon, which is in the canon of the Anglican Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and Eastern Orthodox communions, sometimes called Old Testament Apocrypha if you're Protestant, uh, King Solomon is nurtured by snug clothes. It's the same term in Greek, and good care. In other words, this is this is how you, babies are treated, whether it's King Solomon in the royal palace or whether it's a peasant. You wrap up the kids. Mistake number five deals with language of outcast and impure. And this goes back to that original quote we had from the New York Times about this radical inclusion. This is the problem with the rhetoric. So according to Luke, um, at the time at that first Christmas, there were shepherds out in the fields watching over their flocks by night. This tells us, by the way, that at least according to Luke, the first Christmas was not in December because the sheep are in the sheepfold and the shepherds are indoors in December because it's cold. Um, so probably we're thinking springtime. Suddenly an angel of the Lord stands or stands there and, and people are scared because generally when an angel shows up in the Bible, the general response is to be to be scared. 
An angel says, don't be afraid. I'm bringing you good news to all people. And this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And this is where we get this whole heavenly host singing. This must have been so amazing. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Really something to wish for. So that's part of the Christmas wish. So where do we get the idea of the marginal and the outcast? The idea that shepherds are marginal and outcast and impure. So by bringing in the shepherds, uh, the Christmas story brings in the marginal, the outcast, and the impure. Uh, they're not marginal, they're not outcast, and they're no more and no less impure than anybody else. Um, if shepherds were so marginalized and demeaned and impure, then it would make no sense to pray Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And indeed, were shepherds outcast, no one would listen to them. But in fact, the people do. When the shepherds saw this, they made, this is the baby and, and his mother, Mary, they made known what had been told them about this child, i.e. by the angels. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had told them. If the shepherds were marginal and outcast, everybody would have said, oh, you're just shepherds. Why would we listen to you? You're marginal and outcast and clean. Go away. They don't. Ironically, it is possible that since Bethlehem is about six miles, I don't know what that is in kilometers, uh, about six miles outside of Jerusalem, it's possible that the flocks the shepherds were watching were the temple flocks because you need sheep to make offerings of sheep. Uh, perhaps these are the temple flocks. And here we have a sense of Jesus as the, as the Lamb of God. Could be, can't prove it, but I like the idea. Mistake number six is the idea that the temple was hopelessly corrupt, a terrible system. And the temple becomes important in the Christmas story because, first of all, the Gospel of Luke begins in the temple with Zechariah the priest making an offering in the temple. And in Luke chapter two, we have Mary and Joseph bringing baby Jesus to the temple where he meets uh, an old prophet um, and, an, and uh, both male and female, an old man named Simeon uh, and an old lady named Anna who proclaim him. So here's just one, it's an old comment, uh, but it's fairly standard across the board in much Christian preaching that somehow the temple was restrictive and elitist. And with the birth of Jesus and then with his healings and exorcisms, God's grace becomes available outside the walls of the temple, uh, which had prevented people from receiving divine compassion. And here again, we have that negative view of Jewish purity, where the author of this article talks about the vigorous purity codes enforced. Um, and this author also ends by talking about the story of the widow and her, her two coins, which we find in the Gospel of Mark chapter 12, also repeated in Luke. That's not in Matthew. Um, that Jesus was grieved at the way that the widow was manipulated into giving up her last two coins to the temple. So what we have here is frequently called the temple domination system. Not called that by Jews, by the way, but called that by Christians who simply do not understand how the temple functions. And Luke provides us the very helpful uh, critique of that, uh, where Mary and Joseph, after having the child circumcised, when it's time for their purification, this is 40 days after the birth, um, they bring him to Jerusalem to present him to God, because that's what one is commanded to do. And they offer a sacrifice as stipulated in, in the Torah, in, in the five books of Moses, uh, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. The temple actually worked on a sliding scale. You could offer a sheep, you could offer an ox, I mean, it's high-end offering, uh, but you could offer a couple of pigeons, uh, low price. Um, and for people who say it shouldn't cost anything, that would be like saying to to, to people who, who are you know, socially, uh, economically marginal, to people who don't have much money, you know what? When you come into the church, don't put any money in the collection plate. Don't you just save it. Um, and that disempowers even poor people who still have something to give. And just as the poor person who puts money in the collection plate knows that later that afternoon, if you need money to pay the grocery bill or money to pay the electric bill, you can usually get it from the church. So people in the Jewish system knew that if you didn't have any money, you could get it from your local synagogue that would help you. You could get it from the temple that would help you. So here's the correction about the temple. This is the Western Wall, by the way, uh, what is remaining of the Herod's temple, the temple where Mary and Joseph came to offer their sacrifices. 
if we think about the temple as a place of exploitation, and we sometimes get that by Jesus talking about you had made this place a den of thieves or a cave of robbers. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with exploitation. The expression den of thieves or cave of robbers comes directly from the book of Jeremiah, a prophet from, to use the Christian term, the Old Testament. A den of thieves or a cave of robbers is where thieves or robbers go to feel safe. Um, I don't know if you have the expression man cave, um, usually a re retrofitted garage uh, where there's a beer cooler and a, a big TV set. Um, a den of thieves is where people thieves go after they've stolen something to count up their loot. So a den of thieves would be, in Jeremiah's idea, uh, people who sin during the week and then come to the temple and offer sacrifice and think everything is just peachy between themselves and God. A church, um, if it if there were a person who attended the church um, who during the work week was a, a loan shark or a contract killer or an arms trader, uh, and then on Sunday morning comes into church and, and puts um, puts a lot of money in the collection plate and then feels like everything is peachy between him and God, that makes the church a den of thieves. It makes the church a place where thieves feel safe. That's not what's supposed to happen. According to Paul, I mean, the epistle to the Romans, Paul's talking about his kinsmen, as he puts it, by race, his fellow Jews. He says they're Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship. And the Greek term for worship is latreia. The underlying Hebrew would be avodah. Sounds like avocado, but avodah. And that actually means temple service. Jesus is dedicated in the temple. We just saw that. A little later in the Gospel of Luke, in the same chapter, chapter 2, Jesus says to Mary, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? So Jesus calls the temple his father's house. And we know from the book of Acts, the sequel to the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus' followers continue to worship in the temple. So try not to make the temple this awful institution. Mistake number seven, that Jews only love fellow Jews and Jesus invents universalism. And we sometimes get this with the idea of the coming of the Magi. But that's not correct either. It is true if we look at the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18, that Leviticus says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, or you should love your neighbor who is like you. Really, love your neighbor really does mean love your fellow Jew. Uh, but Jews are not just a religion. We're also an ethnic group. We're also a people, which is in part why the term anti-Semitism is part and parcel of racism, dealing with the people not because of their belief, but because of who they are ethnically. Uh, but Judaism doesn't say just love fellow Jew. You love the fellow Jew because the fellow Jew is, who is, is like you. Uh, but Leviticus, the same chapter in verse 34, goes on to say, the Hebrew word here is ger, G-E-R. It really means the not native born or the migrant or the not you who lives near you or lives among you. The ger who lives among you shall be to you as the native born among you. You shall love the ger as yourself for you were gerim. You were migrants. You were immigrants. You were strangers in the land of Egypt. And you knew what happened to you in Egypt. The first thing is you were enslaved. And the second thing is the government wanted to kill you. So you love the fellow Jew, the fellow Israelite, because that person is one of you, who you are. And you love the not you, because you knew what it was like to be an alien, to be a stranger, to be a migrant. So you love the migrant because you know what it feels like to be socially, socially vulnerable. So Jesus did not invent universalism. So what do we know about Jewish-Gentile relations? Well, we can actually see some of this material even from the Advent stories. The Magi, who are from either Babylon or Persia, probably Babylon, which would mean Iraq. If it's Persia, it's Iran, but it's places to the east. They get to visit Mary and Joseph. They first go to Bethlehem. That, the technical term for this would be tourists. Um, Joseph and Mary find refuge in Egypt when King Herod the Great decides to kill all the babies, and baby Jesus' life is threatened. They're refugees. Jesus and his disciples go across the Jordan River to the Decapolis. That's the place where the pigs go over the cliff in the Gospel of Mark chapter 5. They are teachers and evangelists. Paul goes between Jerusalem and the Diaspora. He's an apostle. 
Jews are supposed to be a light to the nations. You can't be a light to the nations if you're not letting them see any of that light and you're not living among them. And we have Jews living in the diaspora. And Gentiles were welcome to worship in synagogues and in the Jerusalem temple. It would not surprise me that when Jesus is presented in the temple and he meets elderly Simeon and elderly Anna, that there might have been some pagans around there going, I wonder who this kid is, because they would have been there. Mistake number eight is the idea that Jesus comes as the Prince of Peace and that a lot of Jews did not follow him because they were expecting a militant Messiah who would take up the sword and forcibly remove Romans from the country. The idea of the Prince of Peace comes from the prophet Isaiah. You will hear this passage read if you're on the lectionary during Christmas time. Wonderful counselor, Prince of Peace. Um, well, is that the case? No. The reason most Jews do not worship Jesus is because he did not bring about, as they understood it, the Messianic Age. And what's the Messianic Age? It's the time when all the Jews in the diaspora come back to the national Jewish homeland, the land of Israel. It's a time when there's a general resurrection of the dead. So it's not a one-off, one person coming back, but everybody comes back. And we can get a sense of that um, in Paul's letters. In 1 Corinthians, Paul refers to Jesus as first fruits of the resurrection. First fruits means final harvest, same season. So everybody comes back. There's a final judgment. There's peace on earth and goodwill to everybody. That's that angelic proclamation in the Gospel of Luke. And the Messianic age for Jews means there's an end to death and war and disease and hunger and poverty. And children do not cry at night because they're scared or they're lonely or because they're hungry. So the reason most Jews do not believe in Jesus as Lord is because Jesus did not bring about the Messianic age as they understood it. Um, which gives us pause to say, well, what was it about him? What was it about the proclamation, about the healings, about the exorcism, about the promises, about the hope, and about the resurrection that his followers were able to proclaim all of that? There were, by the way, various messianic figures in early Judaism. Some Jews thought the prophet Elijah would come back. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John the Baptist takes the role of Elijah. Some people thought John the Baptist was the Messiah. Some people to this day still do. They are called Mandians. They were based uh, until recent political concerns, uh, primarily in Iran. Some Jews were expecting a shepherd like Moses, the good shepherd, some were expecting Enoch, who's seven generations down from Adam and is up in heaven in bodily form. So he's on hold like Elijah. He can pop back. Some were expecting the archangel Michael. According to the Dead Sea Scrolls, hence DSS Dead Sea Scrolls, there were two messiahs plus a prophet. Some Jews expected another messiah from the, tw the 12 lost tribes, the messiah son of Ephraim. If we look in the book of Acts, chapter 5, we have a reference to a figure named Thutis and another figure called the Egyptian, Messianic figures, probably in the 40s or early 50s, just a little bit after Jesus. The Samaritans were expecting someone they called the Samaritan prophet, the Taheb, uh, during the first revolt against Rome. Simon Bargioria, one of the Jewish rebels, was looked at as a messiah. In the second revolt against Rome, there's another Jewish rebel called Bar Kokhba, meaning son of the star, whom some Jews thought of as the Messiah. So Jesus is not the only messianic claimant. There are other, by the way, nonviolent movements that we have within Judaism. Here's my favorite example. Uh, this material comes from the first century Jewish historian Josephus in his books, book called Wars of the Jews. And he's talking about Pontius Pilate. So if you're on this Zoom call, you've probably heard about Pontius Pilate. He is the governor of Judea uh, and the one who was responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. So Pilate, who was not the most politically astute of, of Roman representatives, and Rome did not send its best people out to the provinces, decide that it's a good idea to bring images of Caesar. These would be graven images, violation of one of the Ten Commandments, don't make any graven images, uh, that he would bring in by night. He wants to sneak, sneak them in, th these images of Caesar. Uh, the Jews, Greek is eudaioi, petition Pilate to take them down. Pilate says no. So according to Josephus, uh, who I think was there, 
Uh, they fell down prostrate upon the ground and they continued immovable for five days. Today, we would call this a sit-down strike, and it's the first example we have of one in history. Pilate then basically says, if you don't go to work, if you don't get up, uh, I'm I'm going to send um, I'm going to send my troops out and I'm going to massacre you, and the Jews simply fall down and bare their necks and say, Bas you have to it. You want to kill us? Fine, uh, but we're not going to allow this statue to stand." And Pilate eventually relents. So, did Jews understand nonviolent protest? You bet. Did Jesus understand it? You bet. He got it from his Jewish system. Other mistakes. Um, and here are mistakes that I sometimes hear Jews make, because just as there's sometimes anti-Semitism, or if you want to call it anti-Judaism, I don't want to debate about what the correct term is, because scholars are still debating that. Um, just as Christians say unfortunate things about Jews and Judaism, so I have heard Jews say unfortunate things about Christians and Christianity, because we've all got baggage, um, and, and most of us do not know our neighbors as well as we should, and we're either afraid to ask or we think we know because we're buying into stereotype rather than into correct ideas. Um, so please do not think that Christians have misinterpreted Isaiah when Christians read uh, the Gospel of Matthew, where Matthew says, look, or if you prefer, behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a child. Because the Hebrew only says pregnant young woman. It doesn't say anything about a virgin. But Christians have not misread. They're simply reading with the Greek translation of the scriptures of Israel rather than with the Hebrew. Do not think that Jews would have found a miraculous conception impossible because Jews at the time were telling lots of stories about miraculous conceptions. There's a text that did not make it into the biblical canon called Second Enoch in which a fellow called Melchizedek, and there's actually a Dead Sea Scroll that we, we have named after him, called 11Q Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek shows up in Psalm 110 and in the book of Genesis chapter 14, that he had a miraculous conception. If you read the book of Judges chapter 13 very, very carefully, this is the story of the conception of Samson. It looks, it's very, very funny story, by the way. It looks by the way that Samson's father got some help in the conception process. According to the Dead Sea Scrolls, Noah may have had a miraculous conception. And there are other people on the pagan side who are attributed divine parenthood, like Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, Pythagoras, and so on. Uh, Philo, the Jewish philosopher from Alexandria, a good Jew, um, read a lot of Aristotle, but he's a good Jew, suggested that all those children conceived to elderly parents in Genesis and in 1 Samuel and in Judges all those men got a little bit of help by the Holy Spirit. Um, so when we have miraculous conceptions of, first of all, John the Baptist to an elderly Jewish couple, Elizabeth and Zechariah, and then Jesus to the Virgin Mary, this fits, by the way, within a broader Jewish idea. It's not un-Jewish. So now we move to the question of the importance of words. So I write, I teach, words are very important to me. And one of the problems with words, whether we're writing, it's worse if you're writing, because at least if you have face-to-face -face or Zoom-to-Zoom -zoom connection, you can tell by somebody's facial expression or body language what they might be saying. But words, there's usually slippage between what somebody says and what somebody hears or what somebody writes and what somebody reads. So words are mediating and they're super important. I did want to put in just something from the beginning of the Gospel of John, which isn't technically part of the Christmas story, but I think it should be. John begins, in the beginning was the word. The Greek word for word is logos. And you know that from words like bio, logi, bio life, logi word. So biology, words about life. Anthropology, anthropos, humanity, logi words, anthropology, the study of human beings. Um in the beginning was the Logos, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is a very Jewish thing to say, although most Christians and Jews do not realize this. According to our friend Philo, the Jewish philosopher of Alexandria, writing in Greek, the Logos is the mediator between heaven and earth, which sounds pretty much like what Jesus is doing, mediating between heaven and earth. The divine is made manifest by the logos that is God's image. 
if I gave my students that quote and said, where does this come from? They probably would have responded the Gospel of John, but it doesn't. It comes from Philo of Alexandria, who is not a Christian. Um, in Aramaic, which is the language that Jesus spoke, Aramaic is very much like Hebrew. Aramaic is kind of like going from French to Italian or Spanish to Portuguese. If you can do one with a little bit of study or, or with a couple of glasses of wine so you don't worry about the grammatical forms too much, you can do the other. In Aramaic texts called Targumims, Aramaic translations of the Hebrew scriptures, uh, they use a circumlocution for the name God because you don't want to say God, 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 right? Um, and one of the circumlocutions, the, the alternative titles for God is the word. So uh, because God creates by the word, word becomes another way of referring to God. And wisdom is also another way of referring to God. So this takes us to the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, a book that is in the Anglican and Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox canon. Um, with you is wisdom. She knows your works. She's at the throne of glory. She was right there at the beginning. So when we think about Jesus as word, we can think about him as fitting into a more broadly Jewish conception of how God makes God's self manifest through the word. And this brings us to more difficult topics about what words do we use. And this is something that I think we need to talk about uh, during Christmas time. Uh, this is from the website. I checked this again the day before yesterday. Uh, this is the website for St. James Cathedral, Canada. And this is what they suggest. In the context of Christian liturgy and worship, Israel, the word Israel, does not refer to this political state, i.e. the state of Israel. That is absolutely correct. The state of Israel was founded in 1948. That's not what the Gospels are talking about. They go on to explain. In the biblical text, Israel refers to the historic Israelites, also known as the Hebrews, an ancient Semitic-speaking people. I don't know what Semitic-speaking means, but I think it means Hebrew or Aramaic. In Christian theology, Israel can also refer to all people who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Well, sort of. What's missing here is the fact that Israel also means Jews, and Jews seem to have gone missing in this statement. So if I just look at the Christmas story and I plugged in Israel and I and I, there's stuff in Matthew too, but I figured I'd just stay with Luke. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Um, this is John the Baptist's father talking about what John is doing. They're talking about Jews. Uh, he has helped his servant or child. You can translate the Greek either way. Israel, Jews. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, Jews. He appeared publicly to Israel, Jews. Simeon is looking for the consolation of Israel, Jews. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory for your people, Jews. Uh, a rising and falling of many in Israel. So if we want to talk about the term Israel as referring to ancient Israelites, which sounds to me like people wandering in the wilderness, you know, with Moses, or we want to talk about somehow the new Israel or the true Israel or grafted into Israel, not language that the New Testament uses, by the way, um, as the church, then I think it's also helpful to note that Israel does mean Jews, not just the state of Israel or not the state of Israel, if you want to bracket that. But to remove Jews from our own history, I think, is unhelpful. Um, the importance of the term Palestine. Here's what St. James Cathedral says, um, and you can probably read this on your own pretty well. Um, in ancient times, the land of modern-day Israel was variously inhabited by a bunch of different people, including Israelites and other indigenous tribes. Uh, one of those tribes was the Philistines. The Philistines were probably not indigenous. They're probably related to the Phoenicians uh, who came over the sea, so they're sea people. Uh, but it is true that that's where the word Palestine comes from. The term Palestine was correctly, the cathedral gets this right, um, showing up as early as the 5th century BCE. You can see it in Herodotus. It primarily refers to the, this coastal league of cities. Um, and we have the term Gaza from way back when as well. Um, so these are cities on the coast like Ashdod and Ekron. Gath, you, you would know from Goliath, like David and Goliath, Goliath of Gath, uh, and probably Joppa. 
At the time of Jesus, the land is generally not referred to as Palestine. There are not coins struck with the name Palestine on it. The land is called Judea uh, and up in Galilee. Galilee. The term Syria-Palestine comes into use formally after 135 Common Era, after, so 100 years after the cross, following what's called the Second Jewish Revolt against Rome. And the reason Syria Palestina comes in and you start getting coins not no longer saying Judea but saying Syria Palestina is in part under the effort to erase the name Judea because if you're a conqueror what do you do sometimes you take away the indigenous name and you put in a new name so by calling the place Syria Palestina what the Romans were hoping to do was erase the sense that this was originally or at least in the first century the time of Jesus Jewish land so this raises the question, can we call Jesus a Palestinian? So here, here's a, just a card I found on the internet that Jesus should be referred to as an Arab Jew. I don't think the term Arab is, is quite right here uh, because the, the book of Acts talks about different groups like Cretans. Cretans would be from Crete and Arabs, not as part of that general group here. But should Jesus be called a Palestinian? And there are a number of people who are arguing no, because the term would be anachronistic since the term really comes into use in the second century and the term is being used to erase Jew Jewish presence from the land. Uh, a number of my Jewish friends find the idea of calling Jesus a Palestinian to be highly problematic. Um, and they find highly problematic these new cards that are coming up uh, showing baby Jesus and Mary in, in the rubble of Gaza, as if they are the, the ancient version of what we find in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2, where Herod arranges for having all of the soldiers slaughter the children of Bethlehem, aged two years and younger. But I think this is actually an okay thing to do. In Christian art, Christians generally look at Jesus to be like us. So we have Asian Christ and Black Christ and Hispanic Christ and the blonde, blue-eyed European Christ and so on. Um, this is very famous image from Panama, by the way, and there's a similar image that you can find from the Philippines. This is a Black Christ. Um, so if the Christian wants to see Jesus in, in ethnic particularity, that makes sense to me. Um, if, if I were um, somebody from Africa, I would not just want to be looking at blonde, blue-eyed Jesuses. I'd want to look at a Jesus who looked like me. I mean, that makes sense to me. And that's the way art has always functioned. So how do we make sure if we want to refer to Jesus as a Palestinian, which would be the same thing as referring to Jesus as African or Jesus as Asian or Jesus as Aleut or what Jesus is French. Jesus is Canadian. I'm sure you have some, whatever. Um, how do we have that, that particularity that Jesus is also a first century Jew and perhaps if we talked about Jesus both imaged as a Palestinian, but also imaged as a Jew, we might be able to share something in common because as Palestinian babies are being killed by Israeli bombs, so Jewish babies were killed by representatives of Hamas. And maybe we should grieve with all of these parents. So what words do we use? Words are important and they always say more than what we intend to say. As long as Jesus, he can be any one of us, but as long as we remember that he's also a Jew, that may be helpful. And finally, a few preaching points, um, what the Jewish context adds to the nativity story. So I've written a whole book on this, uh, but here are some of the takeaways that I really like. So I figured since we just did some heavy stuff, I would end with some nice stuff. Uh, here's Matthew's story. Matthew is fully anchored into Jewish history. So I've given you some Greek here just to prove that I actually do have a PhD. Uh, Matthew starts out the account, and the Greek word for account is biblos. And you can probably, more, if, you, if you took algebra, you can probably make out the Bs and the Lamids and the Sigmas. Uh, of the genealogy, the Genesius of Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. Um, and Genesius reminds us of the book of Genesis, same word. Uh, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And this is anchoring Jesus into Jewish history. And then we get this Jewish history. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. So in order to understand Jesus, we have to understand all of that Jewish history. Matthew is telling us that if you start on Christmas Day, you're starting in the middle of the story. You have to go back and figure out who all these people are. And then we have, this is the German production, but the, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And I think this is just Matthew being way cool. 
Matthew tells us as we get down to the through the genealogy, there's a fellow named Matan, and Matan is the father of Jacob, and Jacob is the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. So what do I have here? I have Jacob, the father of Joseph. Well, if I know my book of Genesis, I've seen Jacob, the father of Joseph before, because back in the book of Genesis, there's a fellow named Jacob, right? Um, and he has a child named Joseph. So if Jacob is the name of the father of, if Judah, the father, Jacob is the father of Joseph in the Christmas story, then Joseph, the husband of Mary, his father is named Jacob. What's going to happen? The same thing that happened in Genesis. Jacob, the husband of Mary, the son of, 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 jo uh, of Joseph, sorry, Joseph, the husband of Mary, the son of Jacob, is going to dream dreams and go to Egypt. And Matthew has set that up in the genealogy, which I think is brilliant. In terms of Mary and in terms of names, the name Mary is the most common name among Jewish women in the first century. We know this from inscriptional evidence and textual evidence. So why would a parent name a daughter Mary? Probably in part after Miriam, and the Aramaic would be Miriam, a leader of women. And we can see this in Exodus chapter 15, the Song of the Sea, when Miriam takes a tambourine and all the women followed her with song and dancing. Miriam is, by the way, the first woman in the Old Testament to be identified as a prophet. There are other women prophets, but she is the first. So when we look at the story of the Virgin Mary, can we see her as a leader of women? Can we see her as a prophet? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus is also a new, a new Moses. Um, so Miriam relates to Miriam, the sister of Moses. Jesus is the new Moses. He survives when children all around him are killed. Um, he's got connections to Egypt because of the flight to Egypt. He crosses water in a life-changing experience. That's the crossing of the Red Sea, but it's also the baptism. He faces temptation in the wilderness. For ancient Israel, for Moses, that's the golden calf. For Jesus, it's the temptation by Satan. And then in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, Jesus goes up on a mountain and talks about Torah for three chapters. That would be the Sermon on the Mount. And that should remind us of Moses going up on the mountain and bringing down the Torah in the first place. By the way, in terms of Mary, not only is Miriam likely part of why parents were naming their daughters Mary, but there's another famous Mary in the first century. King Herod the Great, the one who arranged the slaughter of the children in Bethlehem, had, had at least 10 wives. First century Judaism was polygynous. And his most famous wife was a woman named Mariamne, probably named after Miriam the prophet. Uh, she's a Maccabean princess. Uh, so if you know the Hanukkah story, that's her family. Um, and she represents Jewish rule without Roman occupation. So I'm wondering if Mary's parents also named her after Mariamne, Herod's wife, to talk about what it was like to live without Roman rule, what it was like to live with freedom. And did Mary, perhaps named after this princess, share some of those stories with her son? It could be. Here's Matthew citing the prophet Isaiah. And we've already seen a little bit of this, Joseph, the righteous man, uh, resolving to divorce Mary quietly. So what happens? After he is resolved to divorce Mary, an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream. Of course, because he's Joseph, son of Jacob, he's going to have a dream. And the angel says, Joseph, son of David, that's it, anchoring into Jewish history. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because it would have been socially embarrassing. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You are to name him Jesus. The Hebrew name Yeshua it's the same root as the name Joshua or the name Hosea or the word Hosanna. It means save or salvific. You are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. We lose the pun in English, but it's there in Hebrew. And all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. The prophet is the prophet Isaiah. Look, the virgin, the Greek term is parthenos. You know that you know that term from the Parthenon or Parthenogenesis. Shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Side note, Matthew is a very, very good author. 
Uh, and the very last line of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8, verse 20, the resurrected Jesus says to his disciples who were there gathered with him on a mountaintop, look, I will be with you until the end of the age. So what Matthew does is bracket the gospel with the idea of God with us for all time, which I think is just beautiful. The Hebrew does not talk about a virgin. The Hebrew simply says, I've given you the English translation, ha-ama-ha-ra, and I've given you the Hebrew. Ha means the. Uh, Alma means young woman. Um, if you know anybody named Alma, this is the root. Uh, and ha-ra means pregnant. So Isaiah basically says, see that pregnant young lady over there? By the time her kid is old enough to eat solid food, your problems are going to go away. In the Greek, when the Hebrew was translated into Greek, Alma comes in as Parthenos. So what the Greek has actually done is given the lady a little bit more time. If I say, see that pregnant young lady over there, by the time her kid is old enough to eat solid food, you can count up. You figure she's got six months to go in the pregnancy, another two years, you're good to go. Um, if you say a virgin will conceive, basically what the Greek is doing originally is saying you got a little bit more time. You got to get the virgin pregnant first. And then and Matthew was simply reading the Greek. This virgin young woman thing actually becomes a debate between Jews and Christians. And we can see this in the second century. There's a second century Christian author named Justin who writes this book, it's fairly tedious, called The Dialogue with Trypho. Uh, Trypho was a Jew. And Trypho says to, to Justin, Isaiah didn't say virgin, he just said young woman, and the whole thing refers to King Hezekiah. And Justin says, in effect, you Jews changed the text. We had this wonderful Greek translation, and then you Jews came in and changed it. Did they? No. How do we know that? Because we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Justin goes on to say that a pregnant young woman uh, cannot be a sign since a sign has to have a supernatural import. But the fact is, it doesn't. Uh, circumcision is a sign of the covenant. Amos points to a basket of summer fruit and says this is actually a sign if you interpret it differently. Anything can be a sign. Ironically, in the Jewish, Jewish, in the Jewish liturgical tradition, and we read from the prophets every Sabbath, um, 15 of those readings are from Isaiah. But in Judaism, there is no public reading of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. We Jews never hear it, which means that when Jews and Christians are talking about the shared scripture, whether it's Genesis or Isaiah or the Psalms, the Christians may put something in 50-point font, and the Jews will have it in two-point font, or vice versa. So we're sort of, we're reading the same text, but with very, very different emphases. And one way we can break down prejudice and get to know each other better is to read the text with each other to see how we, in fact, get very, very different messages. In terms of the Magi, and we'll finish up there because I really like the Magi. I like the Magi. Uh, at the time of King Herod, and see, Matthew keeps talking about King Herod, King Herod, King Herod, which is Matthew's political way of saying, wait a minute, King Herod is propped up by Rome. He's the king on the throne. And now we have this baby whom the Magi describe as king of the Jews. And Matthew's basically saying to Matthew's auditors, Matthew's readers, who's your king? Is it the one sitting on the throne? Is it the one heading parliament? Is it one God help us in Washington, D.C.? Um, or, is, or is it God? Whom do you worship and from whom do you take orders? So Herod's a little bit nervous about this, right? Because this newborn king of the Jews, he has, he's a Jew. He has no clue. So he has to ask the local experts, the scribes. Um, and the scribes pull out this passage from the prophet Micah chapter 5 um, that talks about this newborn king being born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, as we know, is the city of David. Okay, so Herod's not really happy about this. So he summons the Magi and he, he quietly, you know, it's like on, on, on the QT, and he says, go find the baby. When you find it, come back and let me know and I'll go worship him too. Yeah, really. So the Magi, who are somewhat clueless, go out. Um, and I think Matthew is actually quite funny here. Um, when they saw that the star had stopped, they, they rejoiced with great joy. Not when they saw the baby, when they saw that the star had stopped. I think they're just tired. They're like the kids in the back seat saying, are we there yet? It's actually kind of funny. Uh, they, they come into the house, they see Mary and the baby. Uh, they kneel down and pay the child homage. Then they drop off the Christmas gifts. And then they're also warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, because otherwise they would have gone. 
and they go out for their own country by another road. And I think they're still out there wandering. So what do we do with this Magi story? Just a couple of things. For all those people who want to find the star of Bethlehem because it's a supernova or it's a comet or it's a planetary conjunction, it's none of that. Matthew says the star stood over the place where the child was. So this is the standard Christmas card, right? The star directly sits over the manger. The manger, by the way, is in Luke. In Matthew, they're in a house. Stars do not stop over places. Stars are giant balls of hydrogen gas. If a star stops directly over a house, that means the world is about to be incinerated. Stars back then were heavenly messengers. And we can get a sense of this in the book of Daniel, which talks about how the righteous will shine like the stars of heaven. Well, people actually thought that. Stars don't function like a GPS, right? So this is a heavenly being like an angel. Stop looking for astronomical proof and start looking to the benefit of the story. This is not something to be proved by science. This is something to be believed in the heart. Uh, the Magi only become kings, as in we three kings of Orient are, after the Emperor Constantine. The Emperor Constantine in the early 4th century looked up into heaven and he saw what looked like the letter Rho, that's the P, and the letter Chai, that's the X, and that's a Christian sign because it's the first two letters of the word Christos, Christ. Um, so the Star of Bethlehem after Constantine becomes a political sign with the import is just as these magi who have now become kings come to pay homage to Jesus by following his star. So Constantine thought that earthly kings should pay homage to the emperor by following his sign. It becomes political. The Christmas story is trying to resist the earthly political. And finally, magi are actually Zoroastrian priests. Um, if you want to visit their uh, reliquary, uh, you can find it. I, this is my own picture. Um, this is in Cologne, Germany. You can actually visit the Magi. It's a giant, bold reliquary. Um, Magi in antiquity represent political machinations and pagan wisdom. Uh, there are stories about Magi rebelling against the Persian king. So Herod might have been a little nervous when the Magi showed up. The Roman historian Suetonius tells us that Tiberius, the Roman emperor, worried about political challenge, banished the Magi, including astrologers. And Josephus mentions Magi, as, do, as does Simon Magus. So I had originally thought, and this also goes to anti-racism training, uh, that the Magi were figures of fun because they asked Herod a fairly silly question. Where's the one born king of the Jews? You don't ask that to the king of the Jews who's a paranoid megalomaniac. And I was doing a radio interview talking about the Magi as being kind of silly. Uh, and a fellow phoned in and said, I am a Magus, singular of Magi. I am a Zoroastrian priest. To this day, Magi are Zoroastrian priests. When you talk about Magi, be very careful about insulting somebody else's religious tradition. And he was absolutely right. Finally, we have Matthew depicting Jesus and Mary as refugees. So when people keep telling me the Bible is not my not about migration and not about refugees, it most assuredly is. Finally, the slaughter of the innocents. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he was infuriated. And he sent and killed, which means he had his soldiers do this, all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the Magi. So he waited. Are they going to come back? When are they going to come back? When was the baby born? And this is a massive slaughter. But there's a hint of a messianic time here, which I take to be good news. Matthew says, then was fulfilled what, what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, a wailing in Ramah, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because there are no more. So Jeremiah, writing in the 500s BCE, is envisioning Rachel watching her children being taken from Jerusalem to Babylon in exile, uh, or her children from the northern kingdoms, those 10 lost tribes, being taken from up north, which is where Galilee is, into obscurity and disappearing from history. But Matthew only gives us the first part of that quotation, as if to say, okay, gentle reader, when I, Matthew, give you a quotation, you go look up the rest of that section. It's not just a single verse. And when we read on in Matthew, this is Rachel's tomb, by the way, in the land of Israel. God says to Rachel, 
Keep your voice from weeping and keep your eyes from tears, for there is a reward from your own work. They shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future. Your children shall come back to their own country. This is the Jewish hope to return to the national Jewish homeland. So what do we do with this quotation from Jeremiah 31? For Jews, a return to the homeland. For Matthew, for those parents in Bethlehem, it's the promise of resurrection. And for everybody, it's a recollection of babies who have died because of the failure of political leadership, the cowardice of political leadership, and the dangers of ultranationalism and fundamentalist religion. And that's how the story may move for us. So what are the Christmas gifts? Avoiding anti-Jewish and anti-Christian teaching and preaching. Recovering the Jewish context of the nativity stories and of Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Expressing the hope of peace and hearing through each other's ears. And a final story just to end. Um, following October 7th of last year, um, uh, I was actually in Germany on October 7th, which was very strange for a lot of reasons, came back to the States, and I get a phone call um, uh, early in, in November uh, from a local imam saying, can you come to Belmont University, a local nominally Baptist school in Nashville, to do a program on Israel and Gaza? So this is four weeks into the war. Um, and I really didn't want to do this. I said, please call a rabbi. And he said, no, 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 I, I you know I've tried, but you need to come do this. Um, and I said, well, I'm not a politics person. I, I don't do international law. I, I'm a Jew who does Bible. He said, that's okay. I'm an imam. I don't do international law either. I'm a Muslim who does the Quran. Let's just come and have a chat. About 500 Muslims came. Um, uh, every single Muslim, Belmont, and, and many from the broader Nashville community. We have three mosques in Nashville. Um, and I started uh, being very nervous. And I said to the imam, what do they want to hear from me? And he gave me the best advice ever. He said, AJ, tell them that you feel their pain. Don't do what about, don't do what about ism. There are certain things to which there is no but. Dead babies, there is no but. Kidnapping 80 year olds, there is no but. Bombing with megaton bombs, there is no but. And the meeting went extremely well. The Muslims had absolutely no idea of the Jewish connection to the national homeland. They thought of Jews as a religion and not an ethnic group, and therefore, why would a religion have a homeland? Um, they didn't know how we pray daily for the peace of Jerusalem. Um, and I said to them, "I yes, I am a Zionist in that I think that Israel is the national homeland of the Jewish people. But I also believe that Palestine is the national homeland of the Palestinian people. Now let's have a conversation. How do we figure out how to share this, this very tiny piece of property? How do we learn to hear from each other's ears? And how do we learn to cry with each other? Because if we can start to do that, maybe, would be, maybe would, we would be in a place to make peace with each other. And that then becomes the Christmas wish. Comments or questions from you? Great. Hello, uh, friends. Uh, please join me in offering uh, sincere appreciation for all the wisdom that Jamie, Amy Jill has offered today. Um, and I wonder if you might please also join me in a prayer and in a moment of silent reflection. God, for all that has been shared and received, we give you thanks. Uh, so friends, now is a time that you are welcome to ask questions. Um, there's a, a, an email in the chat, anti-racism, anti-racism at united-church.ca. Uh, so please feel free to send questions there. Um, and I will uh, relay uh, questions that have come um, so far. So one um, 
AJ, I wonder you've you've shared a lot of information, which has been really uh, amazing, and and probably some information that people didn't know of. I'm wondering if you might be able to share um, some very practical ideas um, that people who are here might be able to implement in their own context, in their own uh, in their own local churches. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, it's, I was writing this talk, and I was thinking about it's harder to give it um, <laughs> as I'm hearing these words coming out of my mouth. There's that that the difficulties that you see with pictures on the news uh, it, it, it it's so visceral it's so today even if it's you know the gospel of matthew chapter 2 uh the first thing to do is is to use imagination what i tell my students um because i i'm happy to manipulate them when it works um is when they're preaching or teaching um I want them to picture the people about whom they are preaching or teaching sitting in the front pew right so if they're making a comment about women, then think about women. Uh, and if they're making a comment about migrants or refugees or the disabled, um, then I, I picture these people in the pew and don't say anything that would harm them. So if you have passages like, you know, the blind leading the blind and they'll both fall into a ditch. That's from Jesus, by the way. No, they don't. Blind people know what they're doing. Um, so when it comes to anti-Semitism, if you're preaching about Jews or you're preaching about Pharisees, which in the Christian imagination eventually becomes all Jews, um, picture my children sitting in the front pew and don't say anything that will hurt my kids and don't say anything that will cause a member of your congregation to hurt my kids. I used to bring my kids to class, which was really manipulative. Then they got too old and I had to borrow other people's children. Um, or picture me sitting in the back pew. Because if I hear the gospel being deformed by anti-Semitism or by racism or by sexism or by ageism or whatever, I'm going to be standing up in the back of your church. And the last thing a pastor wants or a priest wants is an angry middle-aged Jewish woman standing up in the back of the church looking very upset. Um, so it's that visceral sense of who's out there, who's listening and trying to hear through other people's ears. If you think something might be a problem, then you, as soon as you think it, then toss it because it's probably going to be a problem and it's not worth the risk. Use decent sources because um, there's a lot of junk on the internet. So use credible sources. Um, like for, for my own concern, the Jewish Annotated New Testament. Um, there's a website called Working Preacher from Luther Seminary in Minnesota that has some very, very good stuff on it. Um, the stuff that, the, the Adele, that you've posted um, including the two articles on avoiding anti-Semitism and avoiding anti-Judaism, which I read this afternoon. Th those are very helpful. So your own website gives some excellent material. Um, and if you're not sure about something, then ask. Um, there are people who have been put on the earth to create beautiful art or to cure cancer, or to shoot rockets to the moon. I was put on the earth to do Jewish Christian relations and, and keep people from bearing false witness against each other. So if I can be of any help to you, you can always feel free to email me. Excellent. Thank you. There are a few more questions have come in, um, so I'll offer two. Uh, one is um, wondering if you might be able to speak a bit more about the course of the temple um, and the relation to the idea of temple as exclusionary. So that's okay. one question. Um, the second question is, um, might some or most Jews consider it offensive for Christians to say that Jesus was Jewish? Oh, I'll well, take the second one first. Now, we're delighted if you say that Jesus was a Jew. That's fine. He's one of ours. Um, so there, there's actually a whole um, uh, kind of like a whole book trade on Jesus, the Jew, the Jewishness of Jesus. Um, I wrote one called The Misunderstood Jew, and then I had to decide that, no, the, the, the last big one is Jesus for everyone, not just Christians, and Jews too. Um, so, I no, I, I'm unaware of, it, unless you're talking like super ultra-Orthodox people who don't even want to use the name Jesus, like, foo. Um, but, you know, the average Jew you're going to meet, yeah, Jesus was, yeah, of course he was a Jew. So was Mary. So was Paul. So, so were all the Marys, right? Magdalene, Virgin, whoever. I mean, they're, they're all Jews. Um, so that part's not a problem. Um, in terms of the temple, that's a really good question. So um, the temple was rebuilt by King Herod the Great. He's the one we just met who kills the babies in Bethlehem. Uh, he builds it in part as a tourist attraction. Um, and pagans or Gentiles 
um, are polytheists. So though the, usually, you know, if you go to a different country, you worship the God of that country. And sometimes when people move and you have diaspora communities from lots of different groups, um, Egyptian diaspora, um, uh, Turkey, what would be Turkey, Asia Minor diaspora, uh, they bring their gods with. And then meanwhile, if you go somewhere else, you might worship those gods. So if you're a Gentile and you wanted to worship the God of Israel, you could do that. And we actually have accounts from Josephus, our first century historian, of Gentiles who did. Now, we actually have two copies of it. An inscription that was at the temple that basically said, Gentiles, do not cross this line. If you are not a Jew, you can't get past this particular balustrade. So that when Herod rebuilt the temple, he built it with a series of courts. So the outer court, which is also the court, is called the court of the Gentiles. That's where all the vendors are, by the way. So you have to pick up your turtle dove or your sheep or whatever. Um, anybody can worship there. Um, then there's this next court, just court of the women. And anybody can be there except for Gentiles, right? And then there's the court of the men, so women can't get in. And then there's the court of the priests that only priests can get into. Um, in Judaism, priesthood is inherited. Uh, in Judaism, if your father's a priest, you're a priest. If your father's a Levite, you're a Levite. Unlike in Christianity, where priesthood, like Anglican priests, Catholic priests, that's a vocation. You are called to it, right? You are not born into it. Um, and then there's the Holy of Holies, the innermost court, uh, the inner sanctum, where the, where the high priest goes once a year on the holiday of Yom Kippur. So you can talk about this as increasing degrees of inc exclusion, which it is, or you can talk about it as increasing degrees of sanctity. Depends upon how you want to play this out. Pagan temples had more or less the same thing. There were places where only the priests of the temple could go, um, and there were places where pretty much everybody could go. The major work of the temple is done in the outer court. So that's kind of where people mill around. Um, if you were a Gentile and you converted to Judaism, could you get in farther? Unclear. It's very, very unclear. Great, thanks. A few more, a few more questions have come in, as well as a few people just commenting um, and naming their thanks and appreciation for all that you've offered. So I um, wonder if I can offer uh, the three questions and you're welcome to respond um, as you would like. Um, so one is uh, remembering reading from a book about providing first century house context and suggesting that Mary might have, have, have stayed not in a stable far away from town, but actually a common area in a house. So would you have any comments around that? So that's Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Um, the, when we talk about no room at the inn, um, and that's that's the standard translation of Luke. Well, the, the word in Cataluma in Luke really means a guest house. Um, and we might think or a guest room, not a guest house, but a guest room. Uh, similar term uh, when um, when they celebrate the Last Supper, they have to find a guest room. Same type of place. OK, um, so it's not your house, but it's a room in a house that you can, in effect, rent out um, or stay in. Um, we get the idea of the stable manger, like outside, from a second century text called the Protevangelium of James. Prot is like proto, like prototype, um, a prior, and evangelium is the word for gospel. Or evangel it's where we get evangelistic. So the pre-gospel or the proto-gospel assigned to James. And this particular James is James, the brother of Jesus, sometimes called James, the brother of the Lord. He's the one who's running the Jerusalem church. So we get to see him in Acts chapter 15. Um, and he's given he's giving Paul some difficulties, as you can see in the epistle to the Galatians chapter 2. So in this configuration, the early church had to figure out if Mary is a virgin and Mary stays a virgin perpetually, which the New Testament does not say, but that became Christian doctrine pretty quickly. If Mary is a perpetual virgin, virgin, why is it that the Gospels describe Jesus' brothers and sisters? Who are the brothers and sisters? Now, this is a good question. And the first explanation was, oh, they're children of Joseph's by a previous marriage. So if you've ever seen iconography of Joseph where he's like an old man hanging onto a staff, that's that image. And it comes from the second century. So, you know, the young hunky Joseph that you get on Netflix, that's a very, very modern thing. Um, so 
James telling this pre-gospel um, explains, he, he tells the story of the nativity. And in this pre-gospel, Jesus is not born in a house. That's Matthew. And he's not born uh, in a, a kind of stably place or a guest room. That's Luke. He's born in a cave. So it's a very, very early legend. Um, and if you go today to the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, if you've ever been there, you actually have to walk down into what looks like a cave to see this. That comes from the second century. Right. So the idea of the, the whole cave manger outside away from everybody, that's a second century model. It's probably a guest room. And did animals stay in guest rooms? You bet. But animals stayed on the first floor, too. I mean, unless you're uber wealthy, which most people were not. Right. A few more questions. A few people are wondering if they might be able to receive a copy of your PowerPoint slides. Um, it's okay. I mean, you can distribute it. You have a copy and okay. you will have the French. Um, okay. You can use it as long as you use it for you. I don't want it being used. I don't want it up on the internet for anybody to watch. Um, I don't want it used for um, public distribution. Um, and the reason I want it for you to use just for you um, is because it goes with my oral material. And without the oral glossing, the slides could be misunderstood. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Also, I'm not sure in some of my pictures if I actually have copyright clearance. I pull stuff from Wikipedia because that's usually for free, but I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> I'm an academic, not a lawyer. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, a few more questions, if you're willing. Um, so one is, um, are the Magi really part of the Christmas story? Um, the person's wondering, thinking, did they come in later after the baby became a child and the family was no longer in a barn but a house? So that's one. Um, and the second is a wondering about the military messiah. Um, and the person offers a bit of context. So it um, says, I'm, I'm confused because in seminary was taught that there were many different interpretations of the Messiah in differing Jewish social and cultural contexts. That in Jesus' time, some Jewish groups thought the Messiah would come as a military leader, while others thought he would come in the form of a king in the line of David. And some believe that the Messiah would establish justice for all, while others believe that he would lead Israel to political ascendancy. So the wondering is why Jesus came to be seen as a political threat if no one was looking for him as a violent liberator. So I wonder right. if you might be able to comment on that. Okay, so two very helpful questions. Um, the whole business about uh, the Magi uh, visiting baby Jesus, um, he's got to be under two years old at the time um, because Herod's trying to date this thing from when the Magi came and then how old is the baby going to be and how long is it going to take to get back? And then he's he's not ma he's not making any chances. There's a huge difference between a new year old, and a, a newborn and a two year old. You, you can tell. Um, so baby Jesus is just little baby Jesus at the time. Um, and it looks like this is happening, you know, within a couple of weeks of the birth, if that. Um, it's really close between where Herod is in Jerusalem and where Bethlehem is. That's, that's a day's journey easily. Um, so, you know, w w was there story added on later? I don't think so. Um, I think for Matthew, the Magi represent the best of pagan wisdom. And Matthew was saying, you can be really, you, you can follow the stars. You can be super wise in pagan wisdom. But you need the Torah, you need the prophets in order to know what the truth is. And this is the idea of the Gentiles representing pagan wisdom coming to worship baby Jesus. It's part of Matthew's broader concern to show how Gentiles fit into the story. The genealogy in the Gospel of Matthew names several women, at least two of whom are Gentiles, Ruth, who is a Moabite, and Rahab, the prostitute from Jericho, who is a Canaanite. So the Magi are also part of the, the foreshadowing of the Gentile mission. In terms of the military Messiah, um, correct. As I noticed, Jews had multiple expectations of who the Messiah would be. Um, we don't have any dominant sense that in the first century they're all expecting an anti-Roman figure. Uh, the anti-Roman figures typically show up at the first revolt against Rome, um, as with Simon Bargioria, whom I mentioned. Um, but the Dead Sea Scrolls are certainly not thinking about booting the Romans out and then getting political autonomy. That's They're, they're thinking about the Messianic age. Um, so what happens in the Christian imagination is that even if, as as the, as the person who wrote in correctly said, well, we learned in seminary, we learned that there are all these different messianic views. In the Christian imagination, it kind of settles down to we're looking for, Jews are looking for a military leader or a king. Some were, some were not. So the question then becomes, 
why, why did, was Jesus perceived to be a political problem if some Jews were looking for a shepherd or whatnot? She, good question. Well, first of all, John the Baptist was also perceived to be a political problem. And some people thought John the Baptist was the Messiah. Why? Um, the first century historian Josephus tells us that Herod engaged in a proleptic uh, uh, strike against John because John was gathering so many people and he was so popular that Herod Antipas became worried that if he came, if he was that popular and John, this charismatic leader, said to the people, let's revolt against King Herod Antipas, they would do it. So Herod strikes first. Um, Jesus comes into Jerusalem uh, in some sort of triumphal entry. I mean, he, he does stage something. Uh, and that's he's a political threat. Rome doesn't like people gathering crowds. The people are hailing Jesus as a king. We can see this in the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Um, Pilate, Pilate recognizes, and the high priest recognizes, that this guy's like a powder keg. He doesn't have to be a king. He just has to be God's representative. And the people are going to crowd around him. And if he were to say something against Pilate, it's going to be a slaughter. Get him off the scene as quickly as possible. So Jesus doesn't have to be perceived of by all as a king. And first century Jews don't have to be thinking of a Messiah as a king. All you, Although he probably was perceived as a king. All you have to do is be a very, very popular leader. And Rome, being an empire, will shoot you down. So Jesus is killed um, under the titulus on the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. And that's basically what Rome says in terms of advertising. You Jews think you have a king. Here's what we, the emperor, the empire, will do to your king. So here's something to think about as we leave. Um, when we get to the book of Revelation, which promotes a king, but also a slain lamb, um, how do we make sure that the tradition does not become the empire how do we make sure that the tradition continues to resist it? How do we work for peace? How do we see through? How do we see through the eyes of our neighbors? Um, how do we bring light uh, into a world that's been so shadowed by negative things? Maybe Christmas, maybe Hanukkah, uh, maybe Kwanzaa, maybe whatever holiday you celebrate in midwinter can be occasion for finding some sort of new light. Um, if I can be of any help to you in doing that, I'd be happy to do it. Thank you for spending some time with me this evening. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the wisdom that you have offered today. Um, so we offer our thanks and appreciation to AJ once again. Uh, and with permission, we will post the PowerPoint slides on the ChurchX page. And the recording from this event will be posted on the United Churches YouTube channel later this week. There's a very short feedback form available from this gathering, and we would very much appreciate it if you're able to fill this out. Um, if you can copy the link and take that away, that would be great. Um, friends, there are also many ways to continue uh, challenging anti-Semitism um, within the United Church. And there may be some additional questions that you have that you'll be able to pose um, in this upcoming series as well. So starting in January, running from January to May 2025, there will be a new online series that is called Countering Antisemitism in Worship. And that is going to be offered through ChurchX. Um, you're welcome to register if you are interested in continuing the conversation, or maybe if you had a question um, that was not able to be answered today, um, that will be an excellent chance to continue to explore and deepen um, some of what we've been talking about today with AJ. So that is available if you are interested in, um, in exploring that. Here's a very short description of what will be coming. Um, that will be a transformative learning cohort series that hopes to deepen your understanding of scripture free from harmful biases. Uh, you'll have a chance to identify and dismantle anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic readings, engaging meaningful dialogue with a diverse community of learners, and explore scripture through a lens of justice, compassion, and understanding. This series will blend together live sessions and self-guided learning, providing you with the flexibility to learn at your own pace. And so you're welcome to register online. Uh, so friends, Thank you once again for being here. We hope that you will continue to find ways of, con of continuing to counter anti-Semitism in worship 
and to continue to challenge anti-racism in all of its forms. Thank you once again to AJ. Thank you to our interpreters, um, um, Alicia and Hugh, who are doing interpretation between English and French. Thank you to Brian, who is doing uh, tech behind the scenes. And thank you all for being here. Blessings to you and uh, good night.